Thank you, Derek. I didn't know CNN would come up at all today, but I was there for a few years. Punchline of the old joke goes, uh, I enjoyed as much of this as I could stand. And, uh, and so I moved on. I got promoted to a box where I work, uh, where I work now. I am uh, so pleased to be here. Thank you, Derek. Very generous of Derek, who's the father of an Air Force Academy uh, cadet, uh, to uh, recognize our son. My wife is here, by the way. Elaine Bennett, where are you? There you are. Stand up, honey. Uh, and uh, I appreciate that. I spoke at the Air Force Academy once, and I hope this doesn't bother anybody in the audience. When I finished my speech, the wing, which is what they call all the students assembled, all the cadets assembled, cheered, and in unison said, give him the bird, give him the bird. And where I come from, that's not a very nice thing to say. But the Air Force Academy, it means give him the falcon. Uh, that's what they give to a speech they enjoy, or a speaker they enjoy. It was a great honor. Uh, and it was, it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful place. Um, I'm so glad to be here uh, with, uh, President, uh, to, with Jeff Hunt and President Sweating. Ellen Armstrong, we saw earlier, delighted to see Ellen. And we still hold Bill in our hearts and memories and prayers, and he is still an inspiration uh, to many of us. Ellen, I want you to know that. And I'm still looking for John Andrews. He's usually here to introduce me, to make fun of me in one way uh, or another. John likes the story I tell about myself in Colorado, where I tell people I've been here before. Um, I guess what I'm proudest of in Colorado, you have 54, 14,000 foot peaks. I've climbed 33 of them. And yeah. John's climbed more. And if you know John and you know me, John's got a climber's body. I don't. But when I get to the top of the mountain, the mountain knows it has been climbed. Believe me. <laughs> fashions. Well, let's talk about fashions. The use of fashion, says C.S. Lewis, the use of fashions in thought is usually to distract men from their real dangers. We direct the fashionable outcry of each generation against those vices of which it is in the least danger. The game. The devil's game is to have them all running around with fire extinguishers whenever there's a flood and all crowding to that side of the boat, which is already halfway under water. The use of fashions, in other words, according to Lewis, was often to recommend to do the opposite of what's needed. In our day, for example, fashion might be to look at the situation with our students see that our funding is increasing across the country in America's public schools, but uh, achievement is down, that our students aren't learning enough, and they are lacking often in focus and memory. Well, the obvious thing to do is to give them marijuana <clears throat> to increase focus and memory. More about that later. I can't be here without speaking about this. We are at a time of a record, we have set a record, uh, worse than the Depression, of able-bodied men not working. There are more able-bodied men in America now not working than at the time of the Depression as a percentage of the population. So what do we do? We encourage eligibility for food stamps and disability so we can get more of them not working. In international affairs, up till recently, where the world needed American strength and leadership the most, we withdrew from it, from it and apologized for it. It is time to reverse those fashions and go in the right direction. Let us write. Let's wake up. Let's reverse those fashions. Let's praise the world that Lord has made, the one that he has made, let's try to restore it. 24 years ago, I wrote and published a book called The Book of Virtues. Thank you. It was fashionable at the time in the publishing world not to accept it. I got 11 turned down notices. This doesn't fit where the country is, said most of the publishers. One said, 
There's no sex, there are no pictures. Who will read it? I said, I think parents will. I think grandparents will. I think they'll read it to their children and to their grandchildren, and maybe even for themselves. Well, those publishers were wrong. It turned out the Book of Virtues became quite fashionable. Usually for reading, sometimes since it was a big book, I understand it was occasionally used for spanking. Not what I recommended, and I once got a complaint in the mail that the book fell out of the upper bunk and hurt the cat. But nothing I can do about that. It'll be almost 25 years since the publication of the Book of Virtues. Maybe we need an updated edition. You want me to do one? There's a lot to be distressed about in the world. And I wake up in the morning, I go to bed at night, as does my wife, and we worry about these things. We worry about our children, although they're in great shape. It's a wonderful statement, you're as happy as your least happy child. That's the way most parents think. And we talk about it almost every day. But we worry about other people's children as well. We worry about children and adults in this country and some of the pointless, mindless, and unnecessary things they're going through. But there are some things to be glad about. There are some things to be proud about and happy about. Whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are true, let's think on those things. Just for one, coming from Washington, but it has repercussions broadly, I am very glad about a man named Neil Gorsuch. I think many of you know him. Coloradans claim him, but he went to my son's Catholic high school, and we are proud to claim him as well. It was a beautiful ecumenical opening, by the way, I have to say. It really was a beautiful um, opening that you had representing so many faiths, Jeff. Terrific. Uh, Gorsuch appears to be taking shape, too, and keeping shape, and not, as we say in Washington, growing in office. I'm delighted he is holding shape. I did a book, uh, my most recent book, uh, about Catholics, just uh, 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 not about Catholics, about Christians, about all Christians, called Tried by Fire. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the book. It's a book about the first thousand years of Christianity. There is a funny Catholic Christian story about that, which is why I just slipped up. Thomas Nelson Publishers called me up and said, would you do this book on the first thousand years of the Christian church? I said, sure. I said, if I do a good job, is there a second volume in me with you guys? They said, well, you know, we at Nelson view religion a little differently than you. Complimentary, but a little differently. We're fine with you on the first thousand years, but on the second thousand years, Reformation and things, we think we'll go somewhere else. I said, perfectly, <laughs> I said, perfectly fine, understood. In that book, I, in order to finish that book, I had to read many other books. I could not believe what I read. Two astounding things. The amount and extent of Christian persecution in that time, and the amount and percentage of Christians who kept their faith. Despite the worst and most unimaginable tortures, these Christians kept their faith. Nobody knows exactly what the percentages are. But faced with the tortures of others, separations, parents from children, these Christians kept their faith. And the other thing I would mention, as sad as it was to read, and as discouraging as it was to read, there were some bright spots. That was in the first thousand years. But as rough and as difficult as it was, and people kept the faith, it is also true there is more persecution of Christians today by numbers than there ever was then. I know you all know that. People held to their faith as we must hold to ours. We held to our faith throughout all sorts of tribulations. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, more than 30 years ago, at one of my alma maters, Harvard, said, Faith can survive the gulag, the worst kinds of oppression and torture. And 
people's faith grew stronger. But he asked a different question, a question for our time, a question that raises this whole issue of fashions. He said, Christianity and faith can survive torture and oppression. Can it survive affluence? Can it survive indifference? Can it survive just being let alone? A classic book that was read in high schools when I was going through school was 1984. And it was about the idea of a dystopia, a country, a place where civil liberties would be destroyed, where the boot of the dictator would be on the neck of every citizen. And it was thought this would be a tyranny, a tyranny of power and authority and restriction. We all thought that if, if tyranny came, that's the way it would come. And indeed, it does come that way in some forms. Look at North Korea, the Soviet Union, look at China. But there was another book that appeared thereafter called Brave New World that suggested people could be subject to a kind of self-enslavement, not by others, but by their own preferences, by their own tastes, by soma, a kind of drug which numbed people to reality. And so people became oppressed, people became indifferent, people lost their faith, not because it was forced from them or tortured out of them, but because they chose to do something else. That, I think, is probably more the worry for many Americans today about their children and about their culture than the notion of a boot on the neck of every American citizen. We have to be aware and up to each challenge of each age. Speaking of the oppression of Christians, one other thing that pleases me is that we have a general, a man running the Defense Department, who does not talk about containing ISIL, containing terrorists, containing Islamic terrorism. He talks about annihilating. Is there any... There are some people with whom we cannot share the world. And I can never get out of my head a picture of those Christians being walked down the beach in those orange jumpsuits with the hoods on and those killers behind them with their knives. By all means, General, proceed with your necessary work. A lot of us paying attention to what's going on in the world are alarmed. We're alarmed about a lot of things. We're alarmed about waste. We're alarmed about what our president calls carnage, American carnage. We're alarmed about gratuitous filth, stupidity, and unnecessary loss. I don't blame you in the audience. I doubt there were very few votes for it in this audience. But how could you do this to the children of Colorado? How could this happen? Are the returns coming in? Are people figuring it out? Why in God's name would someone want to make a drug more available in the form of cigarettes, in the form of candy, in the form of many other forms that destroys or inhibits focus and attention? Start marijuana at age 14. Smoke it regularly, and that's just once a week. And we know that most users use it more than once a week. And you will lose eight IQ points in seven or eight years. Who can afford to lose seven or eight IQ points? The returns are coming in. The returns we see on the news and in the newspapers are not always the accurate ones. I have some sources and people in Colorado who work on this business, and it's a worse story than is generally reported. Now combine this with a nationwide opioid epidemic. This opioid epidemic is 10 to 20 times worse than the cocaine epidemic of the 80s. I was the first drug czar in the United States. People thought it was a thankless job. It wasn't. It was a good job. I was glad to have it. I was glad George Herbert Walker Bush gave it to me. I had one laugh line in the job. As the drug czar, I was able to refer to my lovely wife as Zarling, and to our then two little boys as the Zardines. 
Otherwise, it was pretty grim and serious work. But let me tell you, Alexander Hamilton says, when America takes up arms or takes up a cause, it should go like Hercules. It should move like Hercules. And you know this country did. We read a, led a government effort, but there was a private sector effort as well. Remember the ads, this is your brain on drugs, jumping in a swimming pool, into an empty swimming pool, two fried eggs in a pan, this is your brain on drugs. The country fought back. And people look at this opioid crisis and say, well, there's nothing we can do, just like the marijuana, there's nothing we can do. Well, we did do something, little known fact. But from 1979 to 1992, this country cut in half the number of people using illegal drugs. Even, yes. Sports figures pushed it. Nancy Reagan said, just say no. The intellectuals made fun of her, but the parents didn't and the kids didn't. The kids liked it. They said it's a simple answer. Advertisers got behind it. Even some of Hollywood got behind it. It was quite remarkable. When this country decides to do something and to get serious about it, it can get it done. The day I took the oath for that job, one of the magazines, the business magazines, published a story about the three most powerful criminals in the history of the world, they said. These three drug dealers, these three drug dealers, cartel heads in, in uh, South America. They said, will you be able to do anything about them? I said, well, that's a job for government. Most jobs are for parents and teachers, grandparents, but this is a job for government. Within two years, each one of those cartel heads was either dead or in prison. Thanks to the efforts of some brave people in Colombia, a group called the Delta Force, which some of you may have heard, who's, yeah, <laughs> whose, work, whose work will go undescribed but not unappreciated. When we get at it and are serious about it, no matter what it is, we can bring these numbers down. Where else? have we seen a reduction of 50% in some pathology in this country? My wife's work at the Best Friends Foundation, she works mainly in the inner cities, has brought the rate of teenage pregnancy down. As she teaches her girls, you can wait, you can wait. Be involved in other things, join the jazz choir, do the workout sessions. And all these kids needed was an adult backing up a parent an adult at school saying, do the right thing. There's no reason to surrender. There are certain kinds of surrender that cannot be promised, that cannot be done in the presence of the young. We are not allowed to do that, not to our own children. So despite what the fashions of the age may be, at times we have to resist. And here, this country, we lead the way. I remember when Lech Walesa, the great uh, hero of the resistance in Poland, I remember at Reagan's funeral, Mrs. Bennett and I were there at, uh, in Washington, and I kept looking for Lech Walesa. It was an amazing event, as you might imagine. Gorbachev, Margaret Thatcher, all sorts of people. And I wanted to shake Lech Walesa's hand, the stock worker who helped with the Pope break the back of the, of the Soviet Empire. Couldn't find him anywhere. We went home, we watched on C-SPAN, and there was like Valencia, three people down from us. That's why we couldn't see him. We were looking in front and looking behind. That hero of Poland came to the U.S., addressed the U.S. Congress, and said, you have shown us the way to resist tyranny. Now show us the way to live with freedom. That's the challenge. That's the challenge. It's more than a fashion. America is the place you go to. America is the place the world looks to. And yes, America is the place you go to for leadership against ISIS, against Al-Qaeda, against Russia, against China. But isn't it interesting? At the same time, that is the place you go to for its strength and its muscle. It's, only the, it's also the only place you go to if you're Charlie Gard's parents. That's something about a country, isn't it?
It's a picture that hangs in my office of a Marine in Iraq. <clears throat> He's holding a baby, swaddling clothes. The blood from his uniform is uh, on, that, on the blanket. And here's this Marine, just armed to the teeth, broad-shouldered, tough-looking guy, holding that baby so gently. That's America. That's American strength in many ways. We are the last best hope of Earth, Lincoln said in 1863. We shall nobly save or meanly lose this last best hope of Earth. We're the last best hope of Earth for freedom, the last best hope for morality, and for the protection of faith. And yes, we're the last best hope for little Charlie Guard. We shall still be in the position of meanly, of nobly saving or meanly losing this last best hope of Earth. We're in a fight right now in this country. It's an ongoing one. It's a big political fight. It's a fight in the politics. But it's also a fight in the culture. My friend Alan Gelzo, an interview published in uh, June 30, Wall Street Journal. You may want to take a look at it. He's a professor at Gettysburg College. He said, we ha may have more disunity now, more conflict than at any time in America since the Civil War. And he may be right. But I don't think the country will come apart. And I don't think the fashionable outcries of this generation, the horrible kind of diatribes that we see leveled at some of our political leaders, I don't think they'll last. We bound up the nation's wounds before in a much more bloody and brutal time, and I think we will do it again. So how do we do this? And how do we match it with fashion? Well, as is said up here, making goodness fashionable is a good idea. Making goodness fashionable just for a little while isn't good enough. We want to make goodness fashionable again and again and again. Somebody asked me once in an interview, well, you have a degree in philosophy, you've had these jobs, are you an optimist or are you a pessimist? I said what I always say. I said, I'm with Isaiah. I'm a theoretical pessimist. In the end, it's all wind and ashes. It'll just be these mountains, these gorgeous mountains out here when we were all gone. But operationally, I am an optimist. Wake up each morning and say, what can we do to move the ball today? What can we do to advance the cause of religious freedom? What can we do to advance the cause of defeating our enemies? What can we do to advance the cause of truly educating our children and protecting them? So maybe studying philosophy made me a theoretical pessimist, but I don't know. I guess it was my parents, and maybe my teachers, maybe my football coach. Certainly these days my wife, when we were courting, more than 35 years ago, we just celebrated our 35th anniversary. Not a record setter in this room, I expect, huh? Have you noticed, however, when you tell a young person, they say, how long have you been married? And you say 25 or 30 or 35 years. How often today they say, wow, really? Yeah, used to be fairly commonplace. Let's make that fashionable again, too, may we? Theoretical pessimism, if you wish, but operational optimism, for sure. Let not your heart be troubled. Bring light and salt every day, every morning. And as I repeated to the Holy Father, the Pope, when I met him the second time, Elaine and I had the opportunity to be with Pope John Paul twice. First time, I blew it. A man of words, supposed to be pretty good at this stuff. But we were standing in line, and as we went through the receiving line, Pope John Paul said, a little nod he had, the Parkinson's was just beginning. He said, ah, Mr. William Bennett, the Secretary of Education of the United States, what a very important job. 
What would have been the appropriate thing to say? Thank you. I'm blessed. I'm humbled. It's not what I said. My worst Brooklyn came out, and I said, I got a big job. What about your job? <laughs> he patted me. It was, it was, it was forgiven. <laughs> the next time I was ready. And the Parkinson's was well advanced. He blessed our sons, blessed my wife. He could barely speak. <laughs> and as I stood before him, I said, I am not afraid. And he repeated, be not afraid, be not afraid, be not afraid. Thank you. Thank you.